Go Visit Your Grave, A Story of Reincarnation and the Problems It Brought to Three People by Rog Phillips. First published in Mystic, number one, November 1953. I don't want my fortune told, Bill Myers said. I don't believe in that bunk. Madame Olga shrewdly studied the young man sitting across the table from her. You come to a fortune teller, yet you don't want your fortune told. Why? I know how you do it, Bill Myers said. One-way glass in the armrests of my chair, carefully colored to match the rest of the chair arm. But underneath it is a scanner that reads fingerprints and sends the readings to a fingerprint bank, probably behind that curtain at your back. It identifies the prints and tells you what you want to know about your customer through a hearing aid button concealed under your gypsy shawl. This is the 21st century, Madame Olga said. We march with the times, but that doesn't mean... Bill Myers shook his head. It's phony. I even know how you tell a customer who he was in his last reincarnation. His ten prints identify him uniquely. You cut it down to eight or six or four or two until the fingerprint bank can give other names. You narrow it until you have one other name of a person who died before the customer was born. The procedure is standardized with you fortune tellers so that if the customer checks with another, he will get the same answers. I know the whole thing. And therefore you don't believe in soul transmigration, Madame Olga said. But I do. I believe its story is in the fingerprints of a person. I've learned my own past history and found confirmation in other things. But you didn't come here to let me convince you. Why did you come? I want you to help me play a trick on a friend of mine, Madame Olga. And I want you to pass the word along to your fellow seers, just in case he decides to check up. There's $50 in it for you. Madame Olga hesitated, looked at him strangely. What do you want me to do? His name is Alfred Carter. I'll be with him when he comes in. Maybe somebody else too. But you'll identify him from his prints. What I want you to do is tell him he's the reincarnation of someone who died right here in Los Angeles and is buried in a grave at a cemetery here so he can go see his own grave. I see. Do you have anyone particular in mind? And no one in particular, Bill Myers said. I want to make it good, though. Could you make it a convicted murderer? He took out his billfold, extracted a $50 bill, watching Madame Olga's reactions. Although aware of his stare, she reached for the money. After he had gone, she dusted the bill for prints and let the scanner read them. Alfred Carter spied Francine Ford in a booth near the rear of the cafe. He went back and slipped into the seat beside her. Hi, Francie, he said. We're both early, she said. I came early in the hopes I would get a minute or two with you before Bill came, Al said. Why did you come early? For the same reason. You ask because you hope it's so, Francine Ford said, smiling. Then she frowned in concentration and seriousness. We've been brought up to psychoanalyze ourselves and others continually to trap our unconscious desires and motivations out into the open and be skillful enough when we want to conceal our motives from others to do so. I'll be entirely frank with you on one thing. Al, I believe I could marry either you or Bill tomorrow and be quite sure of a successful marriage. And that's the trouble. I could, but neither of you could, until you finished your competition and one of you has won me decisively. Carter nodded and the loser knows he has lost because of his own faults. I believe you're right, Francie. Come to think of it, I would be disappointed in you somehow if you suddenly chose either of us out of a clear sky. But it never pointed itself up consciously that way to me before. And I think you're right about Bill's motive for getting us together today, Francine said. She shivered in delight. I'm going to enjoy myself, I hope. Now why did I add that qualification? She had no time to answer her own question. Bill Myers had arrived. Hello, Francie. Hello, Al, he said. Been here long? Ordered yet? No, Al said to both questions. Bill said, then let's wait to eat. I ran across a part of the city I'm sure you've never seen before. I hadn't, mostly Mexican and gypsy and stuff like that. I thought the three of us could have fun. All kinds of shops and dives with Mexican food and drinks, fortune tellers, and sidewalk artists who draw your portrait for 50 cents one of the few places left that's just like it was in the 20th century. Especially the fortune tellers, Al grinned. And cafes that served chili warmed over from the last century too, but okay by me. 
How about you, Francie? He smiled at her, knowing she remembered what he had said about playing along. She was looking searchingly at Bill. Fortune tellers? Oh, sure. They have lots of business down there. Some of those people actually believe in that stuff. Must be one in every block. I thought it would be nice to have a Mexican dinner. I'd like that, Francie said. Al, why don't you ever get an original idea? You know, Al said, I like the idea of the fortune teller. I've always wanted to go to one, just to see what it's like. An aunt of mine went to one once, and according to Aunt Bessie, the fortune teller knew her name and all about her without asking a single question. But you wouldn't fall for that stuff, Bill said. I don't know, Al said. He saw Bill's incredulous look. No, no, I'm serious. There's a lot we don't know even yet about the mind. It would take other confirmation to... Okay, Bill said, we'll take you to a fortune teller while we're there. Only let's get going so we can see most of it before dark. Francie and Al smiled at each other. Bill had gained his point with supreme skill, and they both recognized that fact. They also knew that some plan was obsessing his motivation pattern. They ate a Mexican dinner and saw all the sights except fortune tellers. Bill quite skillfully managed the dead-end pause in their sightseeing across the street from Madame Olga's and commented with a superior sneer directed at Al. That seems to be all, except the fortune teller. That sign over there says, two bucks a fortune. Ain't worth it. Oh, I don't know, Al said slyly. I'll pay the two bucks for Francie's fortune. Bill concealed his triumph underneath a scowl of protest. That isn't what I meant. I'll pay for all our fortunes if you're determined to go through with this nonsense. You must believe in the stuff. You're the one who seems afraid of it, Al said. Stop it, Francine Ford said. We'll go in, but I don't want to be first. We'll see what hogwash this Madame Olga hands out to Al, Bill said. They went across the street and entered the feebly lit waiting room. A bell somewhere tinkled musically. Curtains parted and a voice intoned, please enter. Madame Olga sat behind her table, an eight-inch crystal ball before her, an astrological chart on the wall behind her. The customer's chair faced her directly, too heavy to be moved easily. Sit down, please, she said, pointing to the chair, and place two dollars in the golden tray. All looked questioningly at Francine, then boldly sat down. The chair was designed in such a way that it was natural to place his hands in the proper position without doing so consciously. Madame Olga, seeing his hands placed where the scanner could read his fingerprints, concentrated on her crystal ball. You are Alfred Marvin Carter, she said. You were born in Billings, Montana in 2031, which makes you 24 years old on your last birthday, September 8th. You are a car salesman, fairly successful, and are in love with a young lady whom you're not sure of. There are dark clouds in the crystal ball, signifying trouble connected with this young lady, perhaps tragedy that lies in the past. She looked up at Al questioningly. He shook his head. She looked down at the crystal ball again, frowning. Yes, it's in the past and also the future. To get the meaning of the future, we must go deeper into the past to previous incarnations, for in this way, we can understand your karma. She fumbled under her shawl and appeared to meditate. Suddenly, her expression was transformed with surprise. Al, watching her very intently, felt sure the surprise was genuine. Bill felt instant admiration of her acting ability. This is very unfortunate, Madame Olga said. I don't like to give unhappy readings. Go ahead, Al said. He licked his lips. Very well. I see a man. He is you, Alfred Marvin Carter, but in your last incarnation. I can see his death. He is in a room devoid of furniture, in a chair not built for comfort. There are straps around him. He looks at a window through which faces are staring. Pale, serious faces, he breathes deeply. Suddenly his head droops limply. He is dead. This was on October 14th of the year 2029. And his name was Philip Strong. Now I see someone signing some papers to claim Philip Strong's body. I see a funeral with few people attending. I see Philip Strong lowered into a grave and it is in this city at New Forest Lawn Cemetery. Madame Olga appeared exhausted as she stopped talking. You mean I murdered someone and died in the gas chamber? Al said, horrified. Don't believe her, Bill said. She made it up. Madame Olga fixed him with a wise smile. You think so? 
she said, as though there were hidden meaning behind her words. Are you afraid for me to read your fortune? Perhaps it will be equally as interesting, William Myers. How did you learn my name? Bill said, startled. No, I don't want my fortune told. I'm not interested. But he knew by Al's and Francine's taunting expressions that he would have to give in. He took Al's place, but purposefully kept his hands off the chair arms. Madame Olga looked into her crystal ball for several seconds without speaking. It is as I thought, she said at last. In your past incarnation, you were with Philip Strong, and your name was Harold Wilson. Karma is a strange and wonderful thing. You, Philip Strong, were executed for a murder you did not commit. Harold Wilson, now William Myers, killed the woman and planted evidence to place the blame on you. Didn't you, William Myers? No, it's a lot of nonsense. We weren't those people. Who was the woman? Francie said, her voice sounding strange. Sit down, my dear, Madame Olga said, suddenly gentle. Without taking her eyes from the fortune teller, Francine sat down, unconsciously sitting erect, her hands almost flat in the proper position for the scanner to read her fingerprints. But without any pretense of looking into the crystal ball, Madame Olga spoke. You are Francine Martha Ford, born in Tucson, Arizona in 2033. Your mother died when you were four years old, your father five years later. You were raised by an aunt and uncle and given the best of educational upbringing. In spite of that, there are many things you can't understand about yourself. You think they must be due to still buried factors of your earlier life, but you are wrong. They are part of your karma from past lives, a karma that by the strange workings of fate has brought you three together. Yes, you were that murdered woman. You were Mabel Farmer. Your grave too lies in New Forest Lawn. Three graves within sight of one another. A helpless victim of murder, an innocent man sent to the gas chamber for that murder, and the murderer himself, who died by his own hand. Madame Olga laughed, and it was the sound of cold whispering winds in uninhabited places. You are quite unusual, Madame Olga, Francine said. I've never met anyone quite like you. May I come back again sometime? She rose from the chair and half turned toward the exit, her eyes still looking questioningly at the fortune teller. Yes, you may come back, Mabel Farmer. But first, go visit your grave. Or are you afraid it will bring back memories? Yes, you are very strange, Francine said. I think perhaps I might come back at that. She gave Madame Olga a goodbye smile and went out, Al and Bill following her. On the sidewalk, Bill wiped his forehead with the edge of his finger and said, Whoa! What a sadistic creature she turned out to be. Maybe not, Al said. He winked at Francine. What if she was telling the truth? I was reading a very interesting book not long ago, which advanced the theory that the fingerprints carry the record of past incarnations. It did a pretty good job of backing it up with proof, though that could have been faked, of course. In there, when she told me about myself, I was sure there must be a scanner built into that chair and a fingerprint bank behind the curtain at her back with a hearing button concealed under her shawl. That idea was exploded, of course, when she told you about yourself before you could lay your hands on the arms of the chair, Bill. It puzzles me. Either she knows things by some occult power, or you didn't arrange this whole thing as a show to entertain us, did you, Bill? Bill's face turned beet red. Then he exploded into a laugh. I suppose I may as well confess, he said. I did. All's fair, you know, Al only. He made a wry face. That unreconstructed maniac in there must have a hellish sense of humor. My little scheme backfired on me. Let's forget it, huh? Then she did use fingerprints, Al said. She must have gotten yours off the money you paid her ahead of time. Of course she used fingerprints, Bill said. I didn't think you would know about that. I don't believe she used mine, Francie said quietly. But we can find out from the fingerprint bank at the Hall of Science. Let's go over there now and find out. The evening is young. Why bother, Bill said. I told Madame Olga to tell Al he was a convicted murderer. She followed that much of my instructions anyway. I thought it would be enlightening to see how he would react. I'm reacting, Bill, Al said. Francie and I are going to the Hall of Science, coming with us. And if we find she told the truth, Francie said lightly, we can visit our graves in the moonlight. It will be moonlight until after midnight, tonight. Full moon. 
Arr! Bill growled, defeated and a little angry. The fingerprint booth in the Hall of Science was impressive. Charts explained the principles of fingerprint classification, and a plastic model showed the construction of the machine that picked up and stored fingerprints. The brain in which the billions of items were stored was, of course, the standard college gel unit created by DuPont in 1979. The closest thing to duplicating the human brain yet devised, but still a long way from actual ego integration. It used the two-gallon brain, which was the largest. Most servos used the pint size, which could absorb and keep straight quite a few million items in motor sensory association. The card over the scanner plate read, Please place all fingertips firmly against plate for accurate identification. This fingerprint bank contains the fingerprints of every living person and is kept up to date. It will identify you and give whatever information about you it contains. Should any of this information be inaccurate, please notify the government on InfoForm 162 AAA. And there was a stack of blank 162 AAAs on a table. I'll try it first, Al said. He placed all his fingers flat against the scanner plate. At once, a pleasant voice spoke from a small speaker, telling him who he was and giving the data about him that Madame Olga had given, in almost the same words. I'll grinned at Bill. No wonder Madame Olga jumped with surprise. You had asked her to tell me I was the reincarnation of a convicted murderer, and her machine told her I really was. Coincidence, Bill said. It won't include Mabel Farmer and Francie's identification. But it did, and both Al and Francie looked at Bill, their faces a trifle pale. What do you want me to do? Bill shot at them, but he knew there was no way out. He went through the routine. The speaker finally came to what, from his expression, Bill dreaded it would say. Harold Prescott Wilson, 2005-30, with several seconds of swift routine history, then cause of death suicide. But what hung in their ears after the speaker became silent and kept their eyes opened wide in surprise was an almost insignificant factual item just before the cause of death. It was married Olga Paula Bancroft, October 7, 2029. Madam Olga, Francie whispered. Then she's your wife, Bill. Francie nodded her head slowly. All of these years she has lived, and today you walked in and gave her money to play a trick on someone. She brought out your prints on the bill and identified you, and then she knew you were the reincarnation of her husband who had killed himself. Why? Was it remorse at having killed me and framed Al for it? It must have been. Why did you kill me? Bill's lips worked, but no sound came out. This is getting us all worked up, Al said. Let's calm down a bit. Let's go someplace where we can get a drink and relax and think this thing out. Fifteen minutes later, they were in a booth in a cocktail lounge, with martinis in front of them. Now, Al said, what do we have to go on? We have what seems to be incontrovertible proof that we three are drawn together through what the occultists call karma. A certain theory about fingerprints, when applied to us, tells us that in a previous existence, Bill murdered Francine and framed me for it, then killed himself a year later. And all that right here in L.A., after dying, we were reborn in such places as Montana and Arizona and Illinois. But Olga Bancroft didn't die and continued to live here, so she was here when we arrived at our meeting place. But is that true, or is it just according to a theory? Coincidence has a longer arm than most people think. If you sit down in a game of poker and get a royal flush dealt to you, you realize it's coincidence. Our trouble here is that we're wrapped up emotionally and have lost sight of the fact that we're a royal flush. Inevitable, when you consider all the possible groups of three or four people, but superstitions are built on things like this. How did it begin? Bill loves Francine and wants to win her, but I'm his rival. Francine is obviously waiting for one of us to show some admirable or the opposite quality so that she can definitely make up her mind and be satisfied she's chosen the right partner in life. Bill consciously reasons that all people are somewhat superstitious. And if he can get me into a situation where my superstition crops out, Francine will turn away from me to him. He thinks he will be secure in the situation because he staged it. It didn't work out that way. We could get involved in an irrational scene, have something happen that knocked Bill off, 
and Francine and I get married, feeling that karma had worked it out that way. But I won't have any of that. Francine, if you fall into that trap, I won't marry you. It seems to me, Bill said quietly, that we're already in that trap. We can rationalize it away, but the room for doubt still continues to exist. It's already in the process of being shoved into the unconscious in Al He's planting directives with it. Bill made a wry face. Maybe Francine has already discarded me as a possible husband on the grounds that I'm married to Madame Olga. Nonsense, Francine said, but her face flamed red, giving the lie to her words. She calmed herself and went on quietly. You are in the trap, Bill. If I reject you, you will believe it is for that reason, when it will be because you used unethical methods to gain an advantage over Al. And I used an unethical advantage myself, Al said. I pointed it out to you behind his back. We're all in the trap. How are we going to get out of it? We could go our separate ways and forget about it, Francine said, her eyes bleak. Al smiled gently. That violates the first principle of psychology. It would warp each of us for the rest of our lives. We have to resolve this situation completely or we're sunk and we all know it. But how? Bill asked. The very desperateness of his voice showed how firmly it had gripped him. First, Al said, a mirthless smile on his lips, the cemetery. We're going to walk right into the teeth of our insanity. The night watchman became cooperative for $5. He located the three graves in a directory and loaned them a flashlight, keeping his curiosity to himself. It's spooky, was Francine's diagnosis of the full moon and the graveyard. What will this accomplish? Bill grumbled, his anger still gnawing at him. Al wielding the flashlight, Miri chuckled. We should have collected Madame Olga, he said. Then we could have a showdown all the way around tonight. Why don't we go get her? Francie said, pausing. Why should we? Bill grumbled. That's right, why should we? Al said. If our destiny's in the stars, and this is a rendezvous with destiny, she will be here. He made it sound like handwriting on the wall. Francine gasped and looked ahead into the darkness, as though more than half expecting to see the shawled figure of the fortune teller. Even Bill caught himself peering and turned his head away with a short breath of exasperation. They went on in silence, the flashlight and evil eye showing them the way ahead, until they reached the turn. Five tombstones north, Al said. The flashlight counted them and settled on the fifth. They went slowly toward it until they could read the words on it. The name Harold Prescott Wilson. Here's where your body lies, Bill, Al said. What do you mean, my body? Bill said angrily. It's a lot of crazy nonsense -al. Is it, Al said. Methinks thou protesteth too much. I wonder what thoughts went through your head just before you killed yourself. The futility of having murdered Francie and framing me for it? Stop it all, Francie said sharply. That isn't fair. But it is, Al said, and you'll see it before the night's over. Before the night's over. The thought hung suspended above the tombstone darkness, a deeper shadow than all the rest. Try and remember, Bill, Al said patiently. Surely you can remember dying. Damn you, Al, Bill said. Stop it, Francie said, or I'll march out of here and refuse to speak to either of you again. Both men relaxed a little. I think my grave is next, Al said. Shall we go see it? This is crazy, Bill said. Our even being here is crazy. Is it, Al said thinly. It was your idea. Remember? Only in the original version of your farce, you were to be securely perched in the knowledge that it was all a fake, and I was to be cringing before the great unknown. I wonder from what region of your unconscious the formative causes of that idea came. I know where I got the idea, Bill said. I read a magazine expose of fortune tellers and got the idea from that. Al directed the flashlight along the row of tombstones absently. And what did you want to do? Isn't it obvious? Bill snapped. I wanted to make you look like a sap so Francie would choose me. Are you sure? Al said. A part of your mind must have been aware of leaving fingerprints on that money you gave Madame Olga. It hid it from you, trapped you. Why? If your whole being had wanted success, you wouldn't have made any mistakes. The fundamental law of psychology, Bill admitted. And true, Al said. One of the surest ways of trapping your subconscious out into the open is to analyze your mistakes, your pattern of forgetting. They had been moving slowly forward. Ah, here's my grave, Al said. 
The stone was a cheap marker with the name Philip Strong on it. I wonder, Al said, if I knew the truth when I died in the gas chamber for a crime I didn't commit. Did I know you had framed me? I could have known and been unable to do anything about it. The law had convicted me. Only I and you knew that the evidence was framed. I wonder if I died, bitter, or did I believe that somewhere, somehow, in a brighter, better world, the wrong would be righted? That's karma, you know. Francine spoke. Shall we visit my grave, she asked. I think it's time. My watch says, one minute to midnight. I feel the urge to stand on my grave in the moonlight. Surely I must have been a witch to inspire the murder urge in a man. They continued down the row. The tombstone was an ornate one with little cherubs on it. The name was there, Mabel Farmer. Francine stood in front of the stone, looking at it, obviously conscious of standing directly above the body six feet below. I wonder why I was murdered, she said softly, as though only to herself. How awful it must have been to die that way. Was I shot or strangled in a fit of rage? Was I someone who deserved being murdered? Or was I an innocent in someone's way? She nodded to herself. Yes, we should have brought Madame Olga. She must know the truth. She turned slowly and faced Bill and Elle. The truth about the past, I mean. She's already told us, Al said. She told us what she believes, Francie said gently. But is it necessarily true? What are the facts? Philip Strong was executed for murdering Mabel Farmer. Harold Wilson married Olga Bancroft shortly after Philip Strong was convicted of that murder. They lived together as man and wife, then Harold Wilson killed himself. Did he tell Olga he murdered Mabel, or did she come to that conclusion herself? Did he kill himself because of a guilty conscience, or because he was unbalanced by some great grief? Let's analyze Olga's reactions. Hired by Bill, she turns the tables on him, having identified him with her dead husband. Isn't that significant, that her husband returns to her from the grave after all these years, and she treats him like that? Isn't it natural, Al said. He was a murderer twice over, having framed Philip Strong. Suppose Philip Strong actually murdered Mabel Farmer, Francie said. No, don't interrupt. I want to paint a picture. Suppose Harold Wilson, Bill, loved Mabel Farmer, and Philip Strong, Al, killed her. That would make the picture somewhat different. Harold, overcome by grief, marries Olga, who is in love with him. But he doesn't get over loving Mabel. Maybe he comes to believe if he had done things differently. Mabel wouldn't have been murdered at all. From that, it would be an easy step for him to accuse himself of her death as he disintegrated mentally toward the moment of suicide. Olga, not having his love, would react by hating him. She would come to believe in her twisted mind that he had killed himself to escape her, be with his loved one beyond the grave. And that pattern fits more accurately to the present pattern. But it doesn't, Al said. Bill tried to frame me into the position he's now in. Karma works itself out. If you want to believe in karma, he framed me last time. He tried it again, and this time I turned it against him. No, Francine said. That doesn't fit all the facts. Let's go back. You warned me that Bill might have some plan to put you in a disadvantageous light and told me you would play him along and see what it was. That statement was designed to prejudice me in your favor from the start. I recognized that and kept it in mind. I even told you I recognized your motive. And after we left Madame Olga's, you let slip that you had read a book lately on fingerprints and reincarnation. But it was Bill who got the idea for showing you up. He hoped. He got it from reading an article. Where did you get the article, Bill? A magazine named Fate, Bill said, puzzled. I probably still have it around the house. In fact, I know I do, I kept it. But you can't remember how you got the magazine? Francine asked. That in itself is peculiar. Did you buy it at some stand? Is it a magazine you subscribe to? No, I'd remember that. I didn't buy it. Somebody must have given it to me or brought it to my apartment and left it. Probably that. I would remember if someone had given it to me. It's a magazine I'd never read before. You left it there, didn't you, Al? Francine said quietly. Not intentionally, Al said, stony-faced. In fact, it must have slipped out of my pocket. When I got home, it was gone, and I had been several places, including Bill's. There are no accidents, Francine said sharply. Don't you see? Deep in your unconscious, you planned it. You left the magazine with Bill. In a dozen subtle ways, even you weren't aware of, 
you built up the idea in him to the point where it emerged into consciousness. When the time was ripe, your unconscious mind let the right things come to the surface to trick Bill. You didn't make a single error. Bill did. Why did his unconscious mind make him leave his fingerprints on the money? Because it didn't condone trickery and was determined to expose his trickery and make him honest again. Another basic aspect of psychology. Are you sure your thinking isn't becoming prejudicial? Al said quietly. There's another aspect of this testing. You yourself might be found undesirable to both of us. The final reaction, Al, Francine said, smiling. A threat reaction. I didn't mean it that way, nor did I mean any of this cemetery stuff to do anything more than... Al let his voice drift off, frowning. Bring our hidden unconscious motives into the open where they are now, Francine said. So in the end, your total action results in exposing your falsehoods to yourself as you're conditioned to do. We all are. What about the fingerprint evidence? Al said. You don't believe any part of me knew about that? No. It could be chance, like getting a royal flush in the first hand you play in poker. Or reincarnation could be a reality. But it really doesn't matter, does it? Whatever is the truth there, should we let it dominate our lives any more than the theory that atmosphere is composed of molecules? Or perhaps it does affect me to this extent. I'm convinced Harold Wilson loved Mabel Farmer. In the years to come, if I think about reincarnation at all, I will think of that. If I am Mabel and Bill is Harold, our love survived death to live again. Is that romanticism? Then this isn't. Bill isn't too good at deceit on the unconscious levels that determine whether marriage will succeed or not. I'll be able to figure him out, usually. With you, Al, I would always be wondering, never sure. Goodbye, Al. Francine held out her hand spontaneously. And good luck. Take the flashlight with you. We'll be along soon. Thanks, Al said, low-voiced. Then he turned and strode into the darkness. He carried the flashlight but didn't use it. Bill and Francine watched him disappear into the darkness, drawn together by their common bond of feeling sorry for him. Then they were alone underneath the moon, the silence of the dead building a wall, off in the darkness. Two marble cherubs smiled at them in the ghostly light from Mabel's tombstone, and Francine, holding out her hand in invitation, said, Won't you stand upon my grave, my lover? A tender smile quirking his lips, Bill reached for her hand, enclosed his strong fingers around it, and abruptly pulled her to him, embracing her with loving roughness. Never, my darling, he said, 